LawsMarketplace.com, the site where the tribes unite. Check out fresh Israelite apparel for both men and women, with new items added frequently. Don't forget to join the marketplace so you can promote your own products and services. Kwam Yasha Ali. Shalom, family. The soul food topic on tonight is true repentance. We're going to be talking about what it means to truly repent before God and how to get your life in order. Okay? We're first going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and read verses 9 through 11. Gail, I have you read that for me. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Sometimes we make a habit of saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But that's not true repentance if you're not turning away from your wickedness. Okay? So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Salakia. So, Apostle Paul is saying to the Corinthians, um, I'm not, he's saying, I rejoice not that you're sorry, but that the sorrow you feel, that guilt you feel, right, that it's leading to repentance. Meaning it's causing you to feel remorse, causing you to feel spiritual anguish, and now you're looking at yourself through spiritual eyes. And you're seeing what it takes for you to turn from your own evil and to return back to God. Read. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Salakia. Read it one more time. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Salakia. So, godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. Godly sorrow, that is defined as like when Stephen began to prophesy at the time when the Jews um, were persecuting the believers and coming against him. And he, through the Holy Ghost, began to speak and edify the men that were there, right? And when, they got, when Stephen got finished speaking, he saw heaven open. He realized that this would be the end. But the scripture goes on to say that these men were pricked unto the heart. The same thing happened with Peter, right? On the day of Pentecost, spoke and responded to the men that mocked and ridiculed these men who were speaking in tongues. He spoke in such a way that it cut them to the heart. That's a godly sorrow. Now, if that godly sorrow is cultivated within your spirit man and it leads to repentance that is truly of the godly sort so we want that godly sorrow to come upon us which leads us to repentance which in time will lead to salvation if we walk upright truly turning from our wicked ways that's the godly sorrow that apostle paul is talking about read on but the sorrow of the world worketh death for behold, this self-same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, yet um, what carefulness it wrought in you, yeah, what clearing of yourselves, yeah, what indignation, yeah, what fear, yeah, what vehement desire, yeah, what zeal, yeah, what revenge to all things. In all things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Okay, so verse 10 says that that godly sorrow, this kind of sorrow in, um, I can't think of another word, but just the sorrow that the men felt, those certain Jews, in the time of Peter and Stephen, when they spoke and declared words and it pricked them to the heart because they know they were guilty, that type of godly sorrow is not to be repented of. Sometimes when we receive that, that sorrow of a godly sort, we may not immediately turn unto repentance. It may prick us unto offense. 
But if we have a mind to humble ourselves, that offense can lead to our repentance and ultimately to our salvation. That's not to be repented of. Because you're offended, that's okay. That's okay. Because the ones that the Most High has called out of darkness into light, they may be offended at first, but the Most High will begin to stir in their spirit those words that were uttered unto them, that hurt their feelings, that pricked into the heart. And they're going to meditate on that and think about it like, man, he was right. Going to cause them to contemplate their life, their soul, weightier matters. They won't be concerned so much about money and all these material things. They'll start to contemplate spiritual things. And it may lead them to repentance. Verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sword, what carefulness it wrought in you. So it made you think about stuff. You weren't careless anymore. You became careful. What is carefulness? That's defined as the fear of God. Where you don't want to sin anymore. This godly sorrow. Because you're recognizing the judgment that should be applied to your life because of the sins you committed. And now you're filled with godly sorrow. Now it's causing you to contemplate all the wickedness you've done in your past. And look at this opportunity of mercy that's being extended to you by the Heavenly Father through His Son, Yahweh Shai. And now you're thinking about it. Man, I really need to make a change in my life. What carefulness it wrought in you. Okay? Also saying, what, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation. What, when it means indignation, meaning wrath or anger, not towards God, not towards the man that's trying to correct you, but towards yourself. Indignation with yourself. As the scriptures talk that when you turn back to me, you shall loathe yourselves. So indignation. Okay, now your, your thoughts, you're thinking about all the things that you've done. You're thinking about your life. You're considering these things. You're weighing it in the balance. Yahweh Shai said, when you come into the gospel, it's as a man who sought to buy land. And he was, how is it, it worded? He, um, goodness, how is it worded? Oh God, how is it worded? He, uh, <laughs> you can't help me out on this one. Uh, not check the cost, but he, he, uh, count, thank you, counted the cost. He counted the cost. So the same thing, when we have made up our mind to turn back to God in repentance, we have to count the cost. What are we willing to sacrifice to do the will of God? What are we willing to give up to please him? You don't just go into any endeavor, any, uh, uh, Ende Did I say endeavor? <laughs> True right now. You don't go into any endeavor or go into anything that in investment without counting the cost, without going through and thinking it through. Writing down on a piece of paper, what am I going to need for this? How much is this going to cost? Am I prepared to do this? Do I have the time to do it? Do I have the resources? Do I have people that I can count on to help me and aid me in the finishing of this project. You have to count the cost. So in the same way that godly sorrow starts to stir in your mind and in your spirit. And you begin to think about it. Counting the cost. Do I have what it takes to serve the living God? Am I prepared to walk away from this thing? Or these things that have been such a stumbling block unto me. Overcharged with surfeiting. Carried away with the cares of this life. Trying to secure the bag. Yeah, the sins with dust so easily beset us, meaning laid out before us. Can you say yeah. it louder? I can't hear you. Yes. Yes. But if you go into anything, any business venture, any sort of investment, anything like that, you have to count the cost. Buying land, starting a business, going back to school, starting a family, purchasing a home. You have to count the cost. 
You don't just go into that thing willy-nilly. You have to sit down and think about it. And godly sorrow for the repentant individual or one who's leading themselves into repentance, it will cause you to count the cost. Right? Let's read verse 11 one more time. For behold, this selfsame thing, meaning godly sorrow, right? That ye sorrowed after a godly sort, that what carefulness it wrought in you. So again, think about a man who's looking to start his own business or looking to purchase some land and get into farming and agriculture. He may have a little money, but it's just not about going to the owner of the lot of land and just giving him money. Sometimes there's permits you need. Zoning rights and different things if you want to build on that land. Okay, there's a certain uh, uh, skillfulness you need in order to start to plant crops. Taxes and whatnot. There is carefulness that goes to careful planning, as Jonathan mentioned. Reading on. It wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, meaning the loathe yourself, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire. This is something you're passionate about, you want to do, you have to put your effort into it. You got to, because you have to lay aside all of that sin. That sinful lifestyle you lived, you got to put that aside. You can't pick that back up. You can't say, well, I'm going to lay it down for now. I'm just going to give this truth a trial run and see if I like it. And if not, I'll come. No. Christ said, anybody who puts their hands to the plow looking bad is not worthy of me. So if you go into this thing, you got to go with your eyes wide open. Understanding that I have to please the living God by giving up me. And taking on him. Okay? What, ze uh, what indignation? What fear? Yea, what vehement desire? Yea, what zeal? Yea, what revenge? What revenge? Is this talking about revenge against God? Or No. It's not talking about that. Okay? Revenge is like, um, bear with me. Let's see if I can find that scripture. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse... 6, verse 6, okay? So here in 2 Corinthians 7 and 11, it says, what revenge? It's not talking about revenge towards God. This is what Apostle Paul is, is referring to when he says revenge. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So he's talking about the weapons of our warfare, not carnal. You have to bring these wicked, carnal thoughts into subjection, right? you got to make obedience fulfilled within you. So you revenge the disobedience. So that means Apostle Paul is commending to Corinthians. He said, this godly sorrow is leading unto repentance, which will lead unto salvation. It's, it's planting within you carefulness, zeal, fear, okay, and revenge, Re not revenge towards, towards God, but revenge towards the carnal man that you used to reign in your members. You have a made up mind, I'm going to go the path of righteousness. And I'm ready to defend myself against the carnal man that will seek to bring me down. I'm ready to war against him. Revenge. What revenge? That's the kind of revenge you have, uh, Apostle Paul is talking about for the disciples. you got to be prepared to revenge. Okay? Defend yourself against those carnal desires that will come up. Okay? Um, bear with me. Go back to let me just finish that out. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Okay? You have counted the cost. You considered these things. You maybe cried some tears. You maybe had to say goodbye to some people. You had to separate yourself from certain environments that would only bring sinfulness and evil in your life. But now you are in a position where you can truly repent and truly live a godly life. And if you stay on this path, it will lead to salvation. Okay? From there, let's go to Matthew chapter 3 verses 8 and then 10. We're talking about true repentance. Matthew chapter 3, verses 8 and then 10. Yeah. Matthew chapter 3, verse 8 
and verse 10. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. So this is John the Baptist speaking to those that were coming out to him to be baptized. Okay? So he said, repent and be baptized. And now he's given them further instruction. Right? Verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Meaning the godly sorrow. You need that. And those other things that were mentioned in verse 11 in Romans chapter 7. The carefulness. The zeal. The vehement desire. Alright? The fear. I already mentioned that. Probably did. Yes. Okay? And the last part, the revenge. These are fruits met for, uh, for repentance. You need these things in order to truly repent. Without it, it's not true repentance. It's just... You know, kneeling down and closing your eyes and lifting your hands towards heaven and saying, God, I'm sorry, but you're not prepared to give up the life that made the Most High God upset to begin with. What you want to do is have the Most High God have mercy on you when you ask for forgiveness, but not really turn from your ways. You have no intent to turn. We saw this many a time with our ancestors throughout the Old Testament. When he would send prophets but times to them. And he said, I'm, I'm sick of your solemn assemblies. I'm sick of your fasting. I'm sick of all of this fluff. Because I see that you're not sincere. You're not sincere at all. You can cry and you can sing songs and, you know, act the part for a while. But it's not really in your heart to repent. You just want... Forgiveness for your sins so you can have the life you used to have before my judgment came. That's what you want. You enjoyed the life before the judgment. And now you're trying to sing my praises to have the judgment be dissolved. But no. I'm looking for true repentance. Verse 10. Verse 10. And now also the axe is laid unto the roots of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So, John the Baptist said to these men, you need to bring forth fruit meant for repentance. So, he's correlating the fruit that would grow on a tree to us being as trees. So, the righteous, godly sorrow and the, 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 the emotions that go along with that godly sorrow which leadeth unto repentance and eventually unto salvation... That should be the very actions we perform towards God to show him that we are sincere. But if we lack those fruits, being a tree in the garden of God, he's saying as the keeper of the garden, he's going to hew down those trees. Even as Yahweh walked past the fig tree and saw that it bared no figs, and he cursed it and it withered and died. So in the same manner, if we're not producing fruit, we're not walking in the spirit of godly sorrow which leadeth unto repentance, and we're not trying to walk upright and sacrifice the sinful lifestyle we, we, we lived before, then the Father's going to see this tree right here is not bearing any fruit. It's time to hew it down. It's not good for anything but for the fire, for it to be firewood. And that means utter destruction on the day of judgment. Okay? From there, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 27, 33, and then 46 through 50. That's 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 27, 33, 46 through 50. So we're, again, we're talking about true repentance. Go ahead and read. First Kings chapter 8, verse 27. But will Yahweh indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the earth. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll start all over. What happened? I was reading it wrong. First Kings chapter 8, verse 27. But will Yahweh indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. Huh. 
Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten before doubt be smitten. I'm sorry, I'll read it again. Verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house. Go on to 46. Yeah, Verse 46. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives into the land of the enemy, far or near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves. Salakia, so Solomon is praying a prayer towards God in the company of all of his kindred, the children of Israel, as the, this is the commencement after the temple had been built. And he's giving the formula unto us, which shows what true repentance looks like. He's saying, if, it, if there comes a time in the future where my people go into slavery, go into captivity, because we've sinned, because remember, the only reason why we as a people, as a nation, have ever been in captivity is because we sinned against God. We transgressed against his commandments. So... We have to bethink ourselves in the land of our captivity, meaning godly sorrow, carefulness, fear, the clearing of ourselves. Think about these things. Bethink yourselves and say, man, I'm here in the land of my captivity. Man, life is miserable. How is this so? Wait, there was stuff that I did, me and my forefathers, that have led to this experience for me. Read. Verse 47, yet if they bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive. So remember, bethink yourselves even in the land of your captivity, America, Babylon the Great, remember you have to come to remember the sins that you've committed, not just in this life, but as a nation, what we have committed to lead us into this wicked place. Read. Saying, we have sinned and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. Salaki, so hold it right there. These are the fruits met for repentance. Confessing your iniquity. Not putting the blame on anybody else. Not saying because I was molested as a child. Not saying because this didn't go my way and someone hurt my feelings. No, but realizing that it was you that sinned against the Most High God. Read the last part of that verse. Saying, uh, saying, we have sinned. We have sinned. Heavenly Father, I have sinned. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow which leadeth unto repentance which need not be repented of. You need that godly sorrow. If you want to have any hope of salvation, you need to have that. You need that be pricked unto the heart and realize, man, I really messed up. This is my fault. I got to bear the weight of this. I did this. If you don't have that, if you don't have that realization within yourself, then you are not going to walk in true repentance. But you're going to find yourself walking right back into a lifestyle of sin. Because there's no fear, there's no vehement desire, there's no counting of the cost, there's no godly sorrow that exists in your life. There's no revenge against the man of old. That carnal man that you war with every day. You're not putting on the gloves and sparring against him. You said, you know what, I'm tired of being afflicted by it. I'm just going, you can't beat him, join him. That's your mentality. But you must bethink yourselves and say, I have sinned. But if you think beyond that and say, we have sinned, me included. Me included. That I have sinned, we have sinned. Our forefathers have sinned. We have committed this. Read on. Saying, we have sinned and have done perversely. We have done perversely. Meaning, I am, I am worthy of this punishment. We have done perversely. 
I, we are deserving of this punishment. So I recognize fully that I'm in the wrong. Not the most high God. He's only doing what he said he would do if we would transgress. Mm -hmm. I recognize, Father, I'm in the wrong. I messed up. We messed up. I accept it. There's no running away, running away from the reality. There's no denial anymore. I recognize that I am a sinner and I have not kept your commandments. I have been perverse in my life. And I'm tired of that life. I want to do what pleases God. Those are fruits meant for repentance. But if you don't possess that, then you're a tree that is naked and you will be hewn down. Ain't no fruit up there. Ain't no, this tree ain't no good. All right, chop it down and throw it in the fire. Fruits met for repentance. Read on. We have committed wickedness, verse 48, and so returned unto, return unto thee with all their hearts. Say that one more time. And so return unto thee with all their hearts. Return back to the Most High God with all your heart. That is true repentance. With all your heart. Think about what Apostle Paul was commending the Corinthians for. What carefulness. What zeal. What fear. What clearing of yourselves. What revenge. What vehement desire you had. Sorrow of a godly sort. Not to be repented of. I don't feel sorry because I'm seeing the fruits of your repentance. You feel bad about the crap you done did as an individual and as a people. Mm -hmm. And now you're wanting to turn back to God with all your heart because that's what he wanted when he sent his prophets but times. Yes. I don't want this wishy-washy, God, I'm sorry, to turn around and do some wickedness the next day. But I want sincere, true repentance. Okay? Read. And with all their soul in the land of their enemies. So recognizing, look, I'm in the land of my captivity. I may not see a light at the end of the tunnel. Because a lot of time for us, think about the, like, the mentality of a child. When they're getting a whooping, right? They'll cry and make all types of promises. But why didn't you do that before? Okay? Are you truly meaning that? Are you going to do that when this whooping is over with? So in the same manner, we're in the land of our captivity. There's no defined light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. Meaning, we know that the end is near, spiritually, prophetically. But we don't know when that is. We still have to go day by day in the land of our captivity and recognize that it's us that sinned and not our father. So we have to deal with it. We have to deal with the consequence of our actions. Right? It said here, Return with all your heart and with all your soul in the land of your enemies, which led them away captive. So you have to recognize, look, it's me who sinned. I, I accept full responsibility for my actions, which means living a life that's less than a life that I might have planned for myself because I have to bear the weight of the consequence of my iniquity. If I'm not prepared to bear the weight of the consequence, then it's not true repentance. I'm looking just for a way out. So I'll cry and, you know, act like that before the Most High God just to have the pain alleviated. No, I'm not looking to have no pain alleviated. Hit me with your best shot, Heavenly Father, because I know I'm deserving. That's true repentance. Yeah. That's true repentance. Like John said to those men, who told you of the, the destruction that's coming? Who warned you vipers and snakes? So you just looking for a way out. I think John might be fulfilling a prophecy. Let's go check him out and see. You really wasn't trying to repent. Let's go back. Let's go back real quick. Matthew 8, uh, Matthew 3, verse, uh, we start at Matthew 3. No, you stay, you stay there. I'll go back. Matthew 3. Matthew chapter 3. Should be there. Okay, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, 
Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Right? So you like the child that's about to get a whooping and you want to cry and act up and, oh, mommy, I'm so sorry. I'll clean my room. I'll do my homework. You should have did that before, before the wrath came. So the Pharisees and Sadducees was like, I think John might be, you know, fulfilling a prophecy that was talked about in, in Malachi. I think he might be that. I think, you know, what Isaiah was talking about, he might be fulfillment of that prophecy. Many people are going out there and being baptized and repenting. Going out there in the wilderness. Some strange guy out in the wilderness. Let's go pay him a visit. You viper. Well, you, you're not prepared to repent. You're just trying to check it out and see what's going on. You just, you're spies, really. You're spies for the Roman government. For Herod. All right, go back and tell that fox what I'm doing. But don't think that you're off the hook. Because you need to bring fruits met for repentance. Not trying to circumvent or sidestep the judgment but look the judgment straight in the face and say look I'm prepared to get it right if I don't I'm ready to I'm ready to have that judgment hit me square between the eyes because I'm deserving of it because as second Samuel chapter 8 read that last verse you were reading you second Kings I'm sorry second Kings it flipped to second Samuel for whatever reason second Kings in the land of their enemies which led them away captive and pray unto thee toward their land which thou gavest unto their fathers the city which thou hast chosen and the house which I have built for thy name. So recognize that we are in the land of our captivity because I have sinned. We as a nation have sinned. And I'm going to turn not only my heart not only my soul but physically turn turn myself in, in the way of Jerusalem and pray towards my Heavenly Father and confess to Him all of my perverseness, all of my wickedness, all the evil that I've done and say, I'm prepared. How many children will pull down the pants and say, Mom, you whipped me? Not too many kids are going to do that. But that's the way we have to be before the Heavenly Father. If you want any chance of mercy... You need to spiritually pull your pants down and say, Daddy, go ahead and whoop me. Go ahead and whoop me. What? Well, okay. I got I to gotta whoop you. But I'm going to have mercy because you showed fruits met for repentance. You recognize you sinned. You recognize you messed up. And now you're ready to get this punishment. Okay? Was yes. that the last verse? No, sir. 49. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven thy dwelling place and maintain their cause verse 50 and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee and give them compassion before them who carry them captive so, like you. so give them compassion if they do this with a sincere heart confessing their sins turning back to you physically meaning pointing in the direction of Jerusalem as well as turning their heart to you, their soul with all their heart, then then, and only then shall you have mercy and compassion on them. If not, I mean, it will be just like our forefathers who were insincere and who were rebellious and who were liars and, and, and idolaters. You weren't pleased with them and you gave them up to the sword. You gave them up to famine and pestilence. You scattered them to all nations as it is this day. But those who are sincere, you're going to deal with them. Meaning, in the sense of, I'll deal with you. But those who are insincere, I'm not dealing with them. I'll deal with those of my children that are sincere, okay? The end of that verse? Yeah, read that. That they may have compassion on them. Is that the... Our yeah. captives having compassion? That they might have compassion, Pray like Cyrus. Okay? The Most High is prepared. He's, he's able to do that. But you got to repent and keep the commandments of God. If not, you're going to continue, continue to see all the evils that are being plagued upon our people in this land. And in all the other lands that we, wherein we have been scattered. Okay, I'm going to go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 20 through 22. 30 through, 30 through 32. Now I'll read it. Again, that's Ezekiel, chapter 18, 20 through 22. At 30 through 32. And it reads, because we're again we're talking about true repentance. 
what the Bible says true repentance looks like. Okay? Verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness, this is the point I really want you to, to grab hold on to. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So if a man is righteous throughout his life, then that righteousness will be accredited to him. And the same thing with the wicked man. If he's wicked all through his life, then at his end, that wickedness that he performs shall be accredited to him. Verse 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, right? So true repentance, the wicked, meaning he's lived a life that was devoid of keeping of, of God's commandments, right? And keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Why? Because of what Solomon said in 2 Kings. For if you turn, confess your sin, saying, we have sinned, we have done perversely and wickedly, and turn your heart towards God, turn your face towards Jerusalem, and pray into this house that I have built, that you shall have compassion on us. So the wicked, when he repents and turns back to God, the Heavenly Father shall have mercy on him, and she, he shall live. Verse 22. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. And his righteousness, and his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. So all the evil is washed away. The Heavenly Father will not make mention of it anymore. As long as he truly repents and walks upright. Because repentance is not just saying, God, I'm sorry. Repentance is re confessing your sin and not doing it again. That's what the Heavenly Father wants from His people. Not just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The same with the child to their parents. I keep whooping you because you keep sinning against me. I don't want to hear you cry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, when I'm putting that belt against your backside. That's not sufficient for me. I want to see a change of action. I want to see you be reformed. I want to see... Fruits met for true repentance. Okay? Verse 22. Uh, 23 actually. No, where are we at? 30 32. Okay, yeah, thank you. 30 through 32. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways, said Yahweh, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. This is what the Most High is asking of us. Look, I'm telling you right now, don't say my ways aren't equal. If a man is wicked and he turns from his ways and truly repent, I'll have mercy. He will live. I will not even mention all of his wicked deeds if he truly repents. But if you be righteous and turn from your righteousness, then I have to punish you. But this is what I want from my people. Right? Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Because if you continue to do these things, it's going to lead to your destruction. If you are not a tree that is bearing fruits meant for repentance, you shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. Don't, uh, don't let iniquity be your ruin. Repent from all of your transgressions. Not just some, not just most, but all of them. 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. That's godly sorrow. Recognize that I've sinned. No denial. I accept the punishment. I accept full accountability and responsibility for the evil that I have done. I'm prepared to be punished of my Heavenly Father because I'm deserving of it. Make you a new heart and a new spirit. Not trying to point the finger not try to circumvent or sidestep the judgment, but accept it. I want to see a new spirit. I want to see you reformed. If I don't see that, then you're not bearing the right fruit. You're barren, and I'm going to cut you down and cast you in the fire. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Because if you don't change your ways, you're going to be utterly destroyed. 
So I'm giving you an opportunity right now. I'm extending unto you grace. This is the time for you to exercise true repentance. In this time, in this season, turn from all your transgressions. Stop walking in idolatry. Stop walking in adultery. Stop walking in violence and hatred towards your brother. Stop walking in the, the, the failure of keeping my commandments and laws and ordinances. Walk upright and do the things that please me. Turn from all of it and I will have mercy. Verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, said Yahweh God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. All right, let's get Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 31 and 32. I'll read that one. All right, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 31 and 32. And it reads, Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight, for your iniquities and for your abominations. That is true repentance for the Heavenly Father. When you begin to loathe yourselves, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, where Apostle Paul is saying, I do not repent, okay, of the sorrow you feel that is of a godly sort. I'm so glad that your spirit is stirred up with this godly sorrow because it leads to true repentance and salvation. This is what the Heavenly Father wants. For you to look at yourself in the mirror spiritually and say, I'm a piece of crap. Really? Loathe yourselves. I'm a pile of dog crap before the Most High God. I am not worthy. My righteousness is as filthy rags. My good deeds is as unclean things. I, I, I confess I am a sinner and I have sinned greatly. I have offended the Heavenly Father and I've committed transgression and iniquity. World without end. But it's time for me to turn back. Okay? Verse 31. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good. And shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. So you don't need me to provoke you to repentance. You feel it on your, on your, for yourself. You begin to meditate on that thing. What carefulness it wrought in you. What vehement desire it wrought in you. What zeal and what fear what revenge it wrought in you to bring you into a godly lifestyle. You loathe yourself. That is the fruit. That should be the pineapple hanging from your tree. Loathfulness and godly sorrow. I can't believe I did that. Who was I thinking? Man. Loathe yourselves. In your own sight, for your iniquities and for your iniquities and your abominations, 32. Not for your sakes do I this, saith Yahweh God. Be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. So I'm not having mercy necessarily because you were so good. I'm having mercy because of the promises I made to your forefathers. But I want to see a change. I'm extending mercy unto you, not for your own sake, but for my own sake. But with this allotment of mercy, I want to see a change. I better see a change. I better see a change or destruction is coming. You shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. Okay, from there, last scripture. Before you go on to the next yes. scripture, just in reading verse 31, um, to loathe yourself, to, you know, when you can look upon yourself and loathe yourself, for the wicked things that you have done, trans transgressing against the Most High. That's a hard thing for most of us to do, probably all of us to do, but if you will, or if you have a humble spirit, you can, you'll do it. But it's so hard for a lot of us to be able to do that because we, in this society as today it is, you have to love yourself and you're so good. So people are saying, I'm a good person. I'm a, I'm a good girl. Someone with that mentality and, 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 and way of thinking is not someone who's prepared to repent because they don't see any wrong. You got to come to a place where you say, yo, I messed up big time. We have sinned, me individually and we as a nation, have sinned and done perversely. I'm turning my heart totally back towards you. I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm a load of crap. I loathe myself. 
and I accept full responsibility of my evils that have been done and the consequence for said evils. I'm not, I'm not looking to sidestep and evade and, you know, uh, Heisman the judgment. No, I'm prepared to take it. I'm, le I'm, a, I'm prepared to take it right between the eyes because I confess. I realize I am in the wrong and not God. All right, last scripture, we're going to go to the book of Baruch, chapter 2, verses 30 through 33. There's a few verses in Baruch, a few chapters, but let's start with Baruch, chapter 2, verses 30 through 33. I haven't read that. Oh, you don't, you don't have it. Baruch chapter 2, verses 30 through 33. Again, we're talking about true repentance. For I knew that they would not hear me, because it is a stiff-necked people. But in the land of their captivities, they shall remember themselves. This is a fulfillment of what Solomon was talking about many, many years prior. Okay? And th this can also, this is, the, this is like... The duality of this statement is like a fulfillment of prophecy then and also uh, declaring a prophecy for the latter days. Now, okay, 31. And shall know that I am Yahweh their God, for I will give them a heart and ears to hear. 32. 33. And they shall praise me in the land of their captivity and think upon my name. 33. And return from their stiff neck. What does that mean, to return from your stiff, stiff neck? To repent. Okay? And from their wicked deeds. For they shall remember the way of their fathers with sin before Yahweh. Meaning what Solomon said in chapter, was that chapter 8? 1 Kings 8. We have sinned. Me and my forefathers. We have sinned. I take the responsibility of the judgment, the residual judgment of their sin, and the continued iniquity of my own self. I'm prepared to take it. I'm prepared to take it. Because you read in Ezekiel chapter 18 where he says, well, the sins of the father will go upon the father and sins of the son upon the son. That's absolutely correct. If a righteous son is righteous, he's not going to get the father's sin, but he may have to deal with the consequence, if that makes any sense. Okay? If you turn from the wickedness, right, you can be blessed and have mercy of God, but you may still have to deal with the consequence of what your wicked father did. Think about the kings. Yeah, the consequence. We can repent and live right, and the Most High can have mercy on us in the land of our captivity, but we still got to deal with the consequence of our forefathers. That means his word is not devoid. I mean, not devoid, I mean, meaning that, that he's a liar or something like that. No, he'll have mercy on us as an, as an individual. But look, there's still a mess that was left from your fathers. And somebody got to clean it up. Somebody got to clean this mess up. And you have had, may have a made up mind to say, look, there's a mess here. I'm prepared to clean it up. I'm, I may not have made all the mess now. I'm, I'm responsible for some of this mess. I didn't make all the mess, but I'm prepared to clean it up. Because that is what would please the Most High God. We need to clean this mess up. Okay, right there. I'm going to jump down to chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 of Baruch as well. Chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And for this cause, thou hast put thy fear in our hearts. To the intent that we should call upon thy name and praise thee in our captivity. For we have called to mind all the iniquity of our forefathers that sinned before thee. What is that? What Solomon said, bethink yourselves in the land of your captivity. True repentance. Not denying. Well, yeah, I might have did some wrong, but you know, I get through a lot of stuff and I just feel like, I just feel, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. If you are not going to open your mouth and confess that you are in sin and confess that you are responsible, 
the Most High God don't want to hear your words. He don't want to hear it. Because you want to make excuse for remaining in iniquity. That's not true repentance. You're like the Pharisees. You want to see what's going on. But you're not truly prepared to repent. Verse 8. Behold, we are yet this day in our captivity, where thou hast scattered us for reproach and for a curse, and to be subject to payments, meaning tribute, according to all the iniquities of our forefathers, which departed from Yahweh our God. So we're having to pay for their sins, the residual. They paid in their day too. They were judged. But we have sinned as well. We didn't turn back. And so now we're having to deal with it. We're having to deal with it. From there, we're going to jump down. Last verse, Baruch chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. Baruch chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. But be of good courage, O my children, and cry unto God, for ye shall be remembered of him that brought these things upon you. So there is mercy prepared for the repentant at heart. Those that repent and show fruits worthy of repentance, they're going to get that mercy. The Heavenly Father is going to look on you and smile and say, you know what? He all right. She all right. I can deal with them. I can, I can form them into something that I, that's desirable to me. But those who truly don't repent, the Most High God has, has prepared judgment for you. So even though we're in the land of our captivity, be of good cheer. The time of your destruction shall come to an end. And your enemy shall be brought low. Verse 28, for as it was your mind to go astray from God, so you lived a life of wickedness, you lived perversely, you committed all manner of transgression, as it was your mind, you wasn't thinking about God, you wasn't thinking about his commandments, you was in sinfulness, you were in darkness, and you was doing your own thing. And what that was your lifestyle, but now that you're at the point of repenting and turning your heart, turning your soul, this is what we ought to do to truly show forth repentance. For as it was your mind to go astray from God, so being returned, seek him ten times more. That is true repentance. So that, God, I'm sorry, you know I didn't mean to do it. And then you turn around and do it? Enough of that. Later for that garbage. You got to seek him ten times more. You got to put in ten times the effort. Right? So if you read your scripture a little bit, you got to read it much more. You pray just a little bit, you got to pray much more. You fasted just a little bit, you got to fast much more. You meditated just a little bit, you got to meditate much more. You gave alms a little bit or never at all, now you got to start giving alms. You got to show God, I mean what I say. That's true repentance. Seek Him ten times more. Because you've been sinning and acting up all, all the time. I don't believe you. Put your money where your mouth is. God, I mean what I say. I seek you ten times more. I sacrifice all this garbage. All the weight which doth so easily beset me. I am loosing these weights from off of me so that I may more effectively walk upright and please you. You had a question? Not really a question, but an addition to what you were saying. Yes. That we have to be. Speak up. Um, keeping his laws. Yes. His statutes, his judgments, the feast days, the Sabbath. Yeah. In righteousness and sincerity, he's saying, turn from all your, your transgressions and keep my statutes, he said in Ezekiel 18. Keep my statutes. You're not going to show forth repentance by keeping Christmas. Well, I bought gifts for everybody and showed goodwill towards men. No, that's according to your way. Repent and turn from your iniquity and keep my commandments. Show fruits met for true repentance. Shalom, family.